So, uh, so for those of you who don't know or have forgotten, my name's Daisy Campbell. I pulled the cosmic trigger. Uh, or, as, or as someone said, I pulled the cosmic trigger and all I got was this lousy, expanded consciousness. <laughs> um, I pulled the cosmic trigger by staging a production of, uh, of the book by the same name, by Bob. Uh, we did it for a short run in 2014 in, uh, in London and Liverpool. And then again, just in this May, just gone for a full month's run at the Cockpit Theatre in London. And it has been magic. And I mean that quite literally. Um, bef before I sort of crack on and, uh, and tell you what it's all meant to me, uh, I thought I'd just give you a few of the reactions we've had. Blow our trumpet, if you don't mind, briefly. Um, so good I shat myself, said someone. <laughs> These reactions from Twitter. Uh, this one in stark contrast to the woman who, in response to the uh, feedback survey that we, set, we sent out under the question that said, could anything have been improved, wrote, would have preferred to have been sat further away from the man who shat himself. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I laughed, I cried, I got an erection. That was a good one. And we've got the poster covered right there, haven't we? Uh, but it was this one from a, one of a kind of proper newspaper that really kind of knocked our socks off. <clears throat> there are times when you sense that cosmic trigger play is merely the latest ripple in a ritual that's been gradually unfolding for generations. A through line that began at Crowley and wound through the 60s counterculture, passing authors like William Burroughs, Robert Anton Wilson, Philip K. Dick and Alan Moore, through Ken Campbell's science fiction theatre of Liverpool, the music of the KLF, and finally tonight to the cockpit theatre. Wow. You see, that is exactly how this thing has felt. It's felt like the, uh, the latest ripple in a ritual that has been unfolding for generations. So if you'll permit me, I'm going to take you on a kind of whistle-stop tour through what pulling the cosmic trigger has meant for me and the many, many collaborators who've been involved in, uh, in this adventure. I do tend to digress a bit, but uh, hang tight. I hope it will be worth it. Um, so, uh, 10 years ago, it was the, uh, of course, the year that, that Robert Anton Wilson passed away, and they held a memorial. I know there was one held in Santa Cruz as well. There was also one held at the Queen Elizabeth Hall in London. And in my mind, it's almost become like a kind of, a sort of nativity telling in a strange way, because instead of the birth of a savior, it's kind of the death of one. But it was like the three wise men came, uh, bringing their gifts in the form of, uh, of Ken Campbell, Bill Drummond, and, uh, and Alan Moore. Ken Campbell, you see I'm here because of two men, uh, Robert Anton Wilson, of course, and my father, Ken Campbell. And, uh, and it was actually at the, at the memorial, was more or less one of his last public performances within the year. Sadly, he too had also passed away. Um, and so, there they all come, they're coming to the thing, they're bringing their, they're bringing their gifts. And um, why am I telling you that? Oh yes, I'm telling you that. Um, Alan Moore, you see, he, he kind of set us on track uh, for the beginning of the adventure because we got the opportunity to interview him. He ended up being, uh, appearing in the Cosmic Trigger play. You know how I'm talking about Alan Moore? V yeah, uh, good. Um, and he, he ended up actually appearing in the Cosmic Trigger play as fuck up the world's most intelligent computer and, uh, and the kind of vo the voice of, uh, the, the, the voiceover uh, throughout the, the, the play. And so we went to interview him and he said, yeah, the thing you've got to understand, right, is that art and magic are basically the same thing but then you've got high art, and you've got high magic, and that's when you, when you don't know what the fuck you're doing, but you just proceed as if everything is a message from the universe. So in the spirit of not knowing what the fuck I'm doing, I want to take you back to where this adventure began, at least for me. So it's, uh, it's nine years ago, and it's about, it's only a few days after my father's sudden and untimely death, and I'm standing at the crossing point of a number of of roads in Liverpool, in the rain. I'm standing on a manhole cover, and I'm looking up at a bust of Carl Jung. And that's kind of weird, because right at that moment, I was in the middle of an essay about Jung for this master's degree that I was doing, but that wasn't why I was there. I'm not alone. Stood next to me is Prunella G and this chap, Peter Halligan. And we're all looking up at this bust of Carl Jung. The bust is there because Carl Jung 
had a dream about Liverpool. And he wrote about it in this book, Memories, Dreams and Reflections on, remember this, page 223. And in this dream, he realized, he said this dream, incidentally, was the most important dream he'd ever had. And in this dream, he realized that Liverpool is the pool of life. And, uh, and the reason that bust has been erected is due to the tireless campaigning of this chap I'm st stood next to here, Peter Halligan. Because Peter Halligan, he reckons that this exact spot we're stood on, this manhole cover, in fact, is the site of Jung's dream. Right? And then there's another interesting thing. So there's the bust of Jung, but just to the side, there's another plaque, a circular plaque. And it's to commemorate the Liverpool School of Language, Music, Dream, and Pun. And, uh, and that was because 30 years previously, when uh, Halligan here um, had, <laughs> through not an inconsiderable search, came, upos, uh, came upon this uh, Jung dream site, uh, he'd noticed that the building on the corner of two of the streets was in fact derelict. And so he claimed it, he, uh, he set up a cafe and a kind of art center, it became a real hub of the whole underground scene there. And they called it the Liverpool School of Language, Music, Dream and Pun. And the first production to go on there, the first theater production to go on there, was the 11 and a half hour epic Illuminatus, directed by my father, Ken Campbell, starring amongst many others, my mother, Prunella G, as the goddess of chaos and confusion, Eris herself. And, uh, and this was to uh, change the lives of everyone involved, this production. And Eris is my middle name. Um, and then as we stood there, my mum says, and you do know you were conceived in that building. <laughs> I said, what, wait a minute, wait, surely you were far too busy staging the greatest show on planet world for all that nonsense. And she said, no, well, it was 11 and a half hours. There were a few dull bits. So I'm standing on the site where I was conceived, which is also the site of Jung's most important dream. I'm also right in the middle of writing an essay about Jung whilst looking at a bust of Jung. <laughs> and, and they say there's nothing to this synchronicity, Lark. Anyway, it was... Um, Growing up, I kind of knew all about these legends surrounding this production of Illuminatus, but it wasn't until I was in my early 20s, 23 to be exact, that I actually finally got around to reading it, and it was like reading Illuminatus. It was like being initiated into a kind of magical order that almost everyone I knew was already an initiate of. It's like I could finally speak the language of my tribe. You know, I could spot 23s with the best of them. I knew all about the ancient battle between the Discordians and the Illuminati. I uh, understood why communication is only possible between equals, why you can never trust any government, why you should never whistle while you're pissing. And then, I started to see synchronicities everywhere. Life became too colorful, too meaningful, and I began to understand the foolishness of calling your only child Eris. And I flipped out, and I found myself in a very plush loony bin somewhere in Kent. Um, next day, I came down. I had rainbow knickers on my head for very important cosmic reasons. And, um, and I sort of gathered, all the inmates gathered round to find out you know, what new nutters the night had blown in. And they said, well, you know, what are you doing here? I said, synchronicity has brought me here. And so trusting was I by now in the sort of synchronicities that were appearing on an hourly basis. I said, uh, the answer to why I'm here is in that there magazine. Woman was clutching soap opera magazine. I said, open that, any random page, that'll be the answer to why I'm here. <laughs> she, op <laughs> she opened up this, this magazine, and I kid you not, it said in huge pink letters across a double page spread, Daisy must lose some of her passion. <sighs> So uh, that's what Daisy did. And honestly, 10 years later, I thought I'd got that old crazy maker, Arius, back in her box. But this is kind of the wonderful and somewhat worrying thing about this book, Illuminatus, is that almost everyone I know who has read and loved this book has got a pretty similar story to tell. I mean, some are slightly less extreme, some are more extreme. Uh, but tales of uh, bizarre synchronicity is pretty much guaranteed. And often, some kind of tale of a uh, spiritual emergency is... Stanislav Groff might call it, or temporary psychosis, as the rest of the medical establishment would have it. And these are the experiences that, of course, Robert Anton Wilson is writing about in his book, Cosmic Trigger. He calls them the journey into Chapel Perilous, we've heard a lot about today. 
And he, he, this is kind of a, a, for those of you that don't know, I don't know if there's any of us who don't, but I'll just for the, in case, it's a kind of dangerous psychological crossing point brought about usually through researching the occult or conspiracies and from which one can only emerge either agnostic or paranoid. And incidentally, it was only after I read Cosmic Trigger that I finally understood what my dad was always on about when he used to say to me, now listen, Daisy. That's how he spoke. Now listen, Daisy, don't believe anything. Right? Nothing which is the product of a human mind is a fitting subject for your belief. But you should suppose everything, right? Very supposing, very mind expanding, believing, very mind constricting. So, so you know, so believe in, uh, you know, flying saucers, fairies, crystals, you know, God if you must. I suppose you could suppose that one of the big religions had actually got it right, right down to the last nut and bolt. But Daisy, don't believe it. <laughs> or, as Bob more succinctly puts it, convictions cause convicts. So, I'm in this loony bin somewhere in Kent uh, with the rainbow knickers. Uh, in fact, what I was attempting to do is I was attempting to regulate the flow of pronoid synchronicities that I was now experiencing. Pronoia, yeah, the creeping sensation that everyone everywhere is out to help you. Uh, I believe that uh, paranoids favour tinfoil, but I was pronoid, so rainbow knickers were the apt thing. And uh, anyway, I was holding forth one day about my dad's notion of the choices open to the artist. So it goes like this, uh, choice one, you can, uh, you can distract and entertain and therefore deceive, thus helping to sustain the status quo. Choice two, you can pose as exposing wrongs, but in fact deceive, thus helping to sustain the status quo. Choice three, you can expose wrongs and bring about change. Not really possible, according to my dad, because if you really know what's going on, then you can be pretty sure they've got something on you. But there might just be a fourth choice. To pose as exposing wrongs, but in fact deceive, but with such a willful mix of truth and lie, so inscrutably compounded as to send the status quo, hunting for needles that nobody's lost in haystacks which don't exist, <laughs> thus, thus distracting from the ensuing release of hitherto imprisoned forces which will bring about change, but of an unpredictable nature. And uh, <laughs> anyway, there's this surly guy stood back behind the rest of the group. He's not at all amused by the arrival of Rainbow Girl. And he looks me in the eye and says, how long have you been stuck up your father's asshole? Ooh. Um, yeah, anyway, so what am I talking about? Oh, yes. So, so what am I talking about? Hang on, I've got, I got to consult, with, consult the oracle. It's down here, hang on, two seconds. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, choice one, da, da, da. So anyway, yeah, right, okay. It's 15 years since I was uh, reading Daisy Must Lose Some of Her Passion. It's uh, four years since I'm looking at the bust of Carl Jung, and I get a phone call, and it's uh, someone to say, could we meet to discuss the possibility of staging Illuminatus? And I thought, I'd remembered my dad's face. Any time anyone ever mooted that possibility, he'd kind of go white. And, uh, and I remembered the rainbow knickers. And I remembered I'm trying to get out of my father's arsehole. <coughs> and so I, I declined. And, uh, and then the next day, I got another phone call who, from someone who knew nothing about the first phone call, saying, could, Daisy, could we meet to discuss the possibility of staging Illuminatus? And I thought, oh, God, here we go. Illuminatus-related synchronicities are back. And I'm not sure I'm going to be able to outrun them this time. Uh, but I knew I didn't want to do Illuminatus. I didn't want to go down that particular rabbit hole. I wanted to find the next ripple in this unfolding ritual. So I was thinking, well, what's the logical next thing? Well, the, the next book that Bob wrote, of course, was Cosmic Trigger. And he kind of wrote Cosmic Trigger in part to deal with what had happened to him as a result of having co-written, of course, um, Illuminatus. And, you know, when you think what's happened to me just as a result of reading it and many others, I mean, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if everyone here is here due to their own sort of equivalent rainbow knicker moment uh, brought on through reading Raw. Uh, you can sort of begin to imagine what's in the 
Cosmic Trigger, yeah, Cosmic Trigger. I was getting excited now. I raced home. I found my dad's battered old copy. I thought, I'm going to test it. I'm going to turn it to page 223 because that's where the dream was written about in the Jung book. And on page 223, it's where Bob comes to London, meets my dad at the opening of, uh, of Illuminatus. And he gets dared by the cast to do a cameo in the Black Mass scene. And so I thought, oh, great, we can have the Black Mass scene in it. We can have Bob naked at the end. We can have, my dad can do a cameo. Great, this is, this is sounding like fun. And so I got to work. And I, was, um, I got, got through a first draft. And then I started to kind of flounder. And I thought, oh, God, is this all a bit daft and cosmic for modern sophisticates? And is there really an audience for Robert Anton Wilson-related theatre out there anymore? And then, as luck would have it, my mum phoned me. She said, I've just met the most extraordinary guy, this guy, John Higgs. Um, he, he'd gone round to my mum's to procure a picture of her as Eris, the one of her at the top of the forklift truck with the dress going down, for those of you who have not seen that one. And... Um, and she said, yeah, I think you really ought to get in touch with him. Anyway, some of you will have come across John Higgs. He wrote a um, biography of Timothy Leary called I Have America Surrounded. He's also written the, uh, the foreword to the new edition of Cosmic Trigger, which I believe is available somewhere at the bookstore. No longer is the meeting on page 223, though. Oh, no. I think it's on 230. Not mm, close. But, you know, maybe things would have gone very differently if you brought that edition out a few years earlier. Who knows? Um, so... Um, so, yeah, John Higgs. So uh, I meet up with John. He says, yeah, there is an audience for Robert Anton Wilson-related theatre, and, uh, and I think I know where to find them. Now, I met John just as he was about to find fame in the UK with this book um, about the KLF. Now, I don't know how much news of the KLF kind of came over to you guys over here, but for us, particularly in the 90s, they were a really big deal. Um, do you remember I mentioned Bill Drummond, one of those three wise men making his way to the memorial? Well, Bill Drummond was the set designer on Illuminatus when it was at the Liverpool School of Language, Music, Dream and Pun. And he then transferred with the production to the National Theatre. And then one day, he went off for some araldite, some kind of glue, apparently, um, and was not seen again for 10 years until suddenly he was the front man in a band who had a number one hit um, in the UK with a band... Called, uh, with a song called The Justified and Ancient, and Tammy Wynette singing about Moo Moo Land. Is this ringing any bells? Um, anyway, so, um, uh, yeah, Moo Moo Land. So the Illuminata scholars amongst you will uh, recognize the reference, I believe, to, uh, here we are, to Moo Moo. Moo Moo, the first and original god, the god of primordial chaos. So this is back when they were writing the Seven Tablets of Creation. The chief deity was Marduk. The priests of Marduk, Marduk monopolized the medium of exchange and were able to extract interest for lending it. They monopolized the land and extracted tribute for renting it. And it was the beginning of what we laughingly call civilization, which has always rested on rent and interest. The old Babylonian Khan. But when the first anarchist group arose, they called themselves the justified ancients of Mumu. They wanted to get rid of usury and monopoly and all the other pig shit of civilization, right? So now the KLF, AKA Bill Drummond and Jimmy Corti, AKA the justified ancients of Mumu, they got this number one, but for them the Holy Grail is the Christmas number one. And they've been at number one for weeks at this point, right? But then Freddie Mercury goes and dies just before Christmas and Bohemian Rhapsody is at number one and they took this to be a sign that the music industry had won and that they were to surrender completely. And so they turned up to the Brit Awards where they just won best band, symbolically shot the entire audience with blanks in machine guns and left a dead sheep on the step saying, we died for you, E-W-E. -E. Uh, <laughs> they then took the statuette that they'd won for being best band and buried it in Stonehenge. And then there, all that remained was the question of what to do about the money that they'd amassed during their adventure in the uh, music industry. And sitting in a cafe in Clerkenwell, Jimmy turned to Bill and said, I think we should burn it. They're talking about a million pounds. And they did. And uh, 
I was just going to say, then they then toured a film called Why Did the KLF Burn a Million Quid? And uh, when nobody could, um, could give them a satisfactory answer, they, uh, they, imposed, they, they self-imposed a 23-year moratorium on themselves that they would not talk about the burning of a million quid for 23 years. In fact, they signed the contract on the side of a Ford Cortina and kicked it off a cliff in Jura just to really seal the deal. That's the justified ancients of Moo Moo. Anyway, what am I talking about? Yes, we did it. We staged Cosmic Trigger. And uh, I, I think it's fair to say it went rather well. Um, and after that first, first performance in Liverpool, a bunch of us pilgrimaged to the bust of Carl Jung and uh, a group of blokes who probably should have known better kind of hoisted me aloft so that I could place a pair of ceremonial rainbow knickers upon his head. And uh, I called out, may our minds be blown, but just right. And, um, and then I remember sort of looking at the, the bust with his rainbow knickers on and thinking, oh, I know why his dream of Liverpool was the most important dream he'd ever had. I bet it was the moment he realized he was finally out of Freud's asshole. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, so the thing was, we, but what we hadn't quite kind of grasped was quite how much was going to be inspired by this production of Cosmic Trigger. You know, it was it was as if for us, pulling the Cosmic Trigger meant to kind of reignite a whole strand of the UK counterculture. I mean, I've sometimes described Cosmic Trigger play as like a poultice of weird. Wherever it is applied, it will kind of draw out all the surrounding weird. And, uh, and boy, did we draw out the weird. First up, Festival 23, the, uh, the UK's first Discordian festival, possibly the world's, I don't know, in, uh, uh, inspired um, two couples from Sheffield to put on a three-day festival. A year ago today, in fact, it was. A year ago today. And, uh, and boy, oh boy, it was the best three days of my life. It was just extraordinary. Um, what did we have? We had the Conspiracy Slam. Uh, we had Human Crufts. Uh, Defense Against the Dark Arts, for reals. A Doctor Who Dalek that spouted the entirety of Illuminatus. And my personal kind of high point, under an actual rainbow that appeared on the last day, people kneeling down to receive their rainbow knickers and become a knickershiet. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so yeah, and that was just the mere, you know, the merest um, uh, sort of sampling of some of the wonderful things on offer at Festival 23, which is on again in 2018, chaps. So uh, if any of you fancy a trip to the UK, time it to coincide with Festival 23, I can assure you. The other thing that emerged from Festival 23 was birthed, one might say, was Hawkus. I need to stop and tell you a little bit about Hawkus. So um, we'd, we, after we'd done the first short run, we'd sort of gathered up so many extraordinary people that we thought, oh, well, we don't know what we're going to do with them all now. And so we thought, well, we'll hold a night of the fools and we'll all symbolically take a leap into the unknown together. And that's exactly what we did. And one of the things discussed that night was, is, <clears throat> is Discordianism due a New Testament? Someone had even mocked up a kind of the classic yellow uh, Principia Discordia instead of saying how I found Eris and what I did to her when I found her. It said how we found the others and what we did with them when we found them. Uh, anyway, that was one of the things discussed, but it was most notably the first time the book was signed. Now, the book, how it works is this. Uh, it's a blank book, big leather-bound magical thing, and a group of people, no more than 23, write in it what it is they're going to do, and they sign it. And then everyone has got exactly the same amount of time, six months until, they, until the deadline. But here's the kicker. If one single person fails to do what they wrote in the book, then you burn the book and no one can partake in a similar ritual for nine years, we decided, right? Okay, so that's the, that's the book. And I'd written in it that I would write a new play to be read at Festival 23, which coincided with when the, uh, the deadline was. And um, it became the play that refused to be written. I mean, I couldn't find a single character, a single plot point. It was, it was this turning into this horrible meta thing about the impossibility of writing the play. It was so meta, it was disappearing up its own arsehole. And um, anyway, in desperation, I phoned one of our most magical consultants, Cat Vincent. I said, Cat, I think I need to invoke a character. He said, you got a specific character in mind or do you want to just see who turns up? 
I said, see who turns up? He said, yeah, that's the dangerous way. Okay, all right, yeah, I think, I think, you're, up to, I think you're up to it. What you've got to do is this. You've got to go meta. You've got to create an altar to the very concept of invocation itself. Every single connection you can possibly think of, everything, represent it, put it on the altar, and then when you are sufficiently steeped and can think of little else, demand that the entity make itself known. And so I did exactly what he said. I created my altar and da, 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 da. I thought, yeah, steeped, yeah, I think so. Uh, and I demanded that the entity make itself known and nothing happened. But then, <laughs> two days later in a second-hand bookshop, a book caught my eye, Hawkus, The Oath in Greek Society. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting, oath. That's why I'm in this mess in the first place because I've gone and made a blooming oath. Anyway, a cursory flick through this book, and it becomes apparent that Hawkus is a god. He's a Greek god. We know a little thing or two about invoking those, don't we? And, uh, and he's the one, it turns out, who comes for you if you don't keep your oath. Not only that, his punishment is nine years in the underworld. I was going, who, ha. Anyway, I thought, right, okay, yeah. Well, at least he'll make a good villain in my play, said I, as the doors of Chapel Perilous swung shut behind me. And uh, anyway, I got back and, uh, to my computer and I thought, right, I'm look up a little bit more about this, this guy, Hawkus. Get this, Seekers. I kid you not, Hawkus is the son of Eris. Oh, yeah. So we may have found the clue to the new uh, testament of Discordianism in Hawkus. Anyway, here's a, li here's a little speech of his from the, uh, from the play. I did do it, incidentally. The book did not burn on my account. And uh, he says that for some reason, I can only hear it in my dad's voice. I'm sure that's not psychologically damaging at all. Um, if you pledge to do something, you've got to do it. And the wilder, the better. Hit me with your craziest plans. It's time for the unearthing of new capers, collective lucid dreams, cosmic cut-ups, absurd creative constraints, art nobody wants, total transformation of mind and all that resembles it. Blake said, if the fool would only persist in his folly, well, I, Hawkus, am here for the folly persisters. Anyway, yeah, that's Hawkus. Um, so uh, so yeah, I think, anyway, John Higgs says to me, well, we did pull the cosmic trigger. I said, I know, John, but I'm not quite sure I know what that means. He said, I think it's to do with meaning. I think to pull the cosmic trigger is to be hit with a tsunami of meaning. And you've got to figure out what that is because you pulled the trigger. Now, for Bob, it was Sirius and 23 and the Eye in the Triangle and Alistair Crowley and the Illuminati. But everyone who pulls the cosmic trigger gets their own tsunami of meaning, right? There's been some, there's been some serious cosmic trigger pulling going on as well, I can tell you. Uh, there's been tsunamis of meaning left, right, and center. And one of them was this woman here, Ishtar. Uh, there she is, entering through the, uh, the gates of Chapel Perilous. And um, so what, <laughs> what happened was, I was doing talks about uh, the fact that we were going to do this play, but we hadn't yet done it. And uh, this woman came up to me after one of the talks and said, I've undergone some kind of minor head explosion listening to your tale. And, um, and I thought I just felt compelled to come and say hello. And I, ever the opportunist, said, oh, well, that's probably because you're meant to come and play Ishtar, the Babylonian goddess of sex and fertility. <laughs> And uh, anyway, cause what I'd, I'd had this notion that the, that the whole play would begin with Ishtar's descent through uh, the gates of hell or Chapel Perilous in our case. And that uh, so obviously as, as Ishtar descends, she sheds symbolically each item of clothing until she enters completely naked through the gates of hell. And I'd had this notion it ought to be a different woman every night and ideally a non-performer so that it would really kind of maximize the authenticity of this particular ritual. Anyway, this woman said, yeah, she'd do it. She'd be the first and she did and she led the way for many others. But afterwards she said to me, you sent me down there, Daisy, but you never brought me out. And it turned out that after her descent, she, uh, she'd become obsessed with the underworld, but not the kind of mythological underworld, the literal underworld, yeah? And it was all about mycelium. She was phoning me up. She was in quite a state. She said, Daisy, I've had a vision. I couldn't think of anyone else I should tell about it except you. And this sort of thing doesn't really happen to me, you know? She said, um, mycelium 
Do, do you know about it? it? It predates all other vegetation on this planet. Now, look, what mycelium is, for those of you who don't know, it's the, it's the fungal threads that, uh, that run beneath the ground, and where enough, enough of them cross, there will, at some point, inevitably be a mushroom uh, that will appear, right? These are the mycelic threads beneath the earth. And uh, she said... Uh, they, they predate vegetation. The, our, our DNA, it's like it's ha, ha, it's, we share half our DNA with mycelium. Um, she said, there are those that think it was a panspermia spore that started all life on this planet. But at the culmination of this vision, Daisy, a voice said, mushrooms are not what they seem. <laughs> And I said, oh, I thought, oh, this is quite interesting, isn't it? I mean, this is a brilliant, if nothing else, this is a brilliant metaphor for underground culture. You know, you've got all these people following their own threads there. And then every so often they'll cross and they'll inspire each other. And then there'll be enough of a kind of crossing point of all these different threads. And woof, this mushroom will appear. And the, the, the muggles, if you like, all they'll see is, oh, look, a cultural phenomenon has occurred overnight. No, no, no. You have to be under the, underneath and realize this is simply a, a part, it's just an expression of a culture that's occurred that you can see, but we can see what's going on beneath. And uh, anyway, yeah, mycelium. What the hell am I talking about? Oh, good. Things inspired by Cosmic Trigger. Next up, money burning. Um, so the jams, as we know, burnt a million pounds, but it seemed like after we did Cosmic Trigger play, money burning was back in a big way in the UK. And uh, look, I even found myself, this is not really money burning, but I found myself the queen on a 23 pound uh, uh, note there. That's rather wonderful. But yes, um, the genius John Harris, I've got here the money burners manual. So, uh, so dangerous, I have to keep it in its cellophane. And uh, the burning issue, I think there are a few copies of these available but it's the magazine exclusively for money burners. You will have to prove you have burnt money <laughs> before you can get your hands on that. As uh, John Harris says, pity the rich, the poor burn. Anyway, yeah, money burning. And then Alan Moore, inspired by this kind of outpouring of creativity, decided to start up, start up the, uh, the 60s Arts Labs movement again. And the Northampton Arts Lab came out with, uh, with this fantastic thing. All of this is over on the table for you to have a look at. So that's the Northampton Arts Lab and Alan Moore at the helm. Uh, then the uh, Brighton Arts Lab started fairly soon after they've just had their launch. Brexit wounds there, you can see. <laughs> Uh, and I've, I mean, I've literally lost count of the number of underground magazines that have, that have come out of this whole movement here. So do check all of those out. And it was while I was preparing to go and talk, do a talk at the Northampton Arts Lab that I, uh, I stumbled upon choice five. Do you remember the four choices open to the artist? I found the fifth. It was a quote by Alan Moore to create a narrative so utterly complex and so endlessly self-referential that it becomes, to all intents and purposes, alive. And then he adds, I can think of no better definition of God. Oh yeah, choice five. Is that what we unleashed when we pulled the cosmic trigger back in Liverpool? This uh, ridiculously complex, self-referential narrative that is becoming alive even as we speak. It could be so. If you think about it, Illuminatus is like the ultimate choice five novel. It comes alive. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that we are now living in a Robert Anton Wilson novel and we need the key. As has already been noted today, we need the key to Chapel Perilous and Bob may well be the key holder so that we can all get out of the collective chapel perilous that we're all going through. And, uh, and then Greg Wilson over here, who's our DJ today, who's gonna be, who's gonna be kicking off shortly. He, um, he'd been doing super weird happenings up and down the UK, but then of April, uh, the beginning of this year, in April, uh, April the 1st, uh, Fool's Day, of course, uh, and where else but in the pool of life, a 14-hour happening that brought all the tribes together, the most extraordinary, um, wonderful day. And then, of course, our run at, uh, at the cockpit as the, the most recent step uh, on what some are now calling Route 23. And we're still waiting the fallout from that one. But while we await that fallout, posters begin to appear. They're from the justified ancients of Mumu, and they remind us the 23-year moratorium is up August 23rd this very year. And there is to be a three-day situation occurring, you guessed it, in the pool of life, Liverpool. And, uh, and then... It went quiet for a while, but then posters began to appear with just a date on. 
So, huh? One month from today, uh, yes, the 400 volunteers, they bought their tickets this morning, in fact. They went in 17 minutes, all 400, bang, gone. And uh, it's a three-day situation unfolding. Uh, the first day, we'll find out why did the K Foundation burn a million quid, and, uh, and then the madness will ensue from there. Now, look, lots of you have been asking me about, are we bringing a production of Cosmic Trigger over to the States? What's going on? Well, you know, I think if we discovered one thing about putting on uh, Cosmic Trigger playing in the UK, it had to grow from below. It had to come out of that culture that we found the others and, uh, and, and pulled together. And so I think the same thing will have to happen if we're to get it over here. So I think we've, you know, this, this, this journey over here is part of trying to strengthen these mycelic underground threads. And, uh, you know, I know some of you have come and spored about with us recently. It was over not, not long ago. And, uh, and I'm sure we'll have to fire back a few spores back and forth before the mycelium threads are sufficiently strong uh, to, to create the inevitable mushroom. And when should we aim for? Well, maybe the clue has come from the justified ancients of Moo Moo. Maybe we should be aiming for the ultimate Discordian you know, pilgrimage. I'm not just talking about the play here. I'm talking about a finding of the others worldwide, 2023. I mean, if we miss this one, guys, we've got to wait till 3023. I know some of us in this room are a little more ancient than justified these days, but I think we can hang on, most of us, until 2023. And there'll be lots of stuff going on before that. There'll need to be if we're to, uh, if we're to sufficiently grow this culture in order that this mushroom can occur. So I just finish on this. Think of me as a panspermia spore. I, uh, I've come over here to bring a bit of our Bob-inspired Discordian culture to you and to take a bit of your Bob-inspired Discordian culture back with me to the UK. And uh, think again on those three wise men. We've got uh, Ken Campbell bringing the gift of the impossible caper. We've got uh, Bill Drummond representing the justified ancients of Moo Moo and bringing us this date. And, uh, and Alan Moore reminding us about choice five. Everything starts with Bob, the original panspermia spore from Sirius, which made all of this possible, this whole coming alive of this uh, incredible, incredible mythology. So um, let's stay in touch, guys. Let's switch to emails. Let's strengthen this, uh, this incredible raw-inspired culture and make it happen. Thank you very much.